your concerns. Thank you, Senator Scott. Thank you, Chairwoman, and thank you, Dr. Kayla, for spending some time with us today talking about some really important issues that we could all uh, spend a day talking about. I only have five minutes. Good news for you. Uh, so my first question is that you're coming into a, a very important position in the midst of really headwinds in the public health space. And I appreciate the enormity of your responsibilities if you are confirmed to lead the FDA. Uh, how do you view the FDA's role in granting emergency use authorization for the new as well as repurposed products to address the COVID-19 pandemic? Should the FDA use a wider latitude to ensure multiple avenues, for instance, uh, drugs like biudesonide uh, as well as COVID-19 testing kits, making sure that they're available to combat the pandemic? Well, as you know, uh, thanks, Senator. It's good to be here with a fellow South Carolinian. I'm wearing my South Carolina bow tie today that my dad uh, had. So I'm just glad it's not Clemson, but continue, please. Hey, 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 I'm a Clemson man. but I know. I'm just joking. Um, you're, you're well aware, and it was during uh, my tenure that the EUA um, guidance was written, that the potential benefits need to be weighed against the potential risks. That's the authority the FDA is given. And so there's a lot of latitude on uh, the types of things that you mentioned. Yet I would still point out we, need to, we do need to have enough evidence that we can make a fair assessment of what the potential is. And we need a system in this country, as I've emphasized over and over, that produces the evidence more quickly. Because under that framework, um, it's possible you could um, get it wrong. There's a, you know, it's different if you've actually measured the benefits and risk and then you're confident about it. And so it's finding that right balance that's really in play for the FDA. No doubt. I would suggest that based on the, uh, the severity of the challenge in the public space that taking the appropriate calculated risk, it seems to be necessary nowadays more than it has been in the past. And I think we can do that in a way that uh, in involves coming to good decisions consistently. Uh, on the front uh, long view of, of public health, uh, I am excited about the role that the mRNA played in bringing the vaccine to the forefront and, and saving millions of lives. Uh, what's the future of that technology for future uh, needs in the vaccine uh, arena, number one? Number two, uh, I think about the 7,000 rare blood diseases that have very few therapies treatments of any sort, and I focus a little bit more on CRISPR technologies for things like sickle cell anemia and that path going forward. Do you see, uh, A, uh, more uh, application for CRISPR in the rare blood space, rare blood disease space, and B, on the future forefront of the mRNAs and vaccines, is that future as bright as it appears it could be with the use of these technologies? Well, this is one of the things, Senator, where um, the excitement of being part of this is what keeps me going and coming back. I mean, um, I'm old enough to remember when the Human Genome Project was just being developed, and now uh, we have the code for the genome. Yes. And what you're describing are the downstream consequences of that with reading the code and producing proteins and other substances that determine whether we're sick or healthy. And there are a whole array of technologies, you know, specifically for mRNA. I think as a platform for vaccines, this is something that um, we've only dreamed about, but it's a reality now. And it, you know, this took a collaboration of FDA scientists and, of course, uh, academia and the private sector all working towards a common goal over decades. But you also mentioned CRISPR and the ability to change the fundamental um, genome is an amazing possibility, but also has significant risks. And so, like everything else, uh, we got to come up with the ideas, try them out, and measure things, and see what really works. But almost nothing could be more exciting than curing a rare genetic disease um, uh, with a gene substitution, perhaps for life. And I think for people with sickle cell disease, I've done a lot of work uh, NHLBI with Gary Gibbons, who's a great leader there. Um, I think this is something that's really needed, and it ties in. You know, chronic treatment for sickle cell disease is not going so well in this country because many of the patients are, live off the beaten path of uh, the big uh, high-tech centers, and yes. we, we've got to get treatments that are more effective. 
Yeah. And, and Chair, if you allow 30 seconds. Yeah. We have, we have several more senators and votes gone. So. Thank you very much. So I would just say that uh, I think we should at least take a second and thank Dr. Francis Collins for his work on the product project that really has produced amazing results for our nation and frankly for the world. His work, uh, I know he's retiring or just retired, his work has been amazing for all of mankind, number one. Number two, I would suggest that as we look into that future, um, the ethical issues around the, the new technologies like CRISPR will continue to pop up around the world. I know that China has had some challenges already with the use of CRISPR, and so what becomes a solution also becomes a problem that's called reality, and um, hopefully we'll wrestle with those ethical issues in the public forum sometime in the very uh, near future. Thank you. Senator Thank you. Baldwin. Senator Baldwin. Thank you, uh, Chair Murray. Uh, I appreciated the chance to visit with you uh, in advance of this hearing, and I wanted to raise an issue that